know, through the years, so that's when I started really getting serious about it. I started gathering books for it. I started um, talking to people about it. And right at the beginning, 2015, I got in contact with someone who, in Amarillo, who hunts these birds, who keeps these birds. Um, typically with falconry, you have to apprentice under somebody for two years. Um, someone who has been a general for three years. So it's a huge, it's a very complicated process. They make it very, very hard to get these permits because these birds are very protected federally. Um, so I started uh, going out with him, watching him hunt, watch, uh, he, he would, you know, show me how to work with equipment, um, show me how to make everything. And sooner or later, I started, uh, I put in my application for a permit. You have to study for a test, um, a state test. Oh, I don't know what it is. Oh, um, <laughs> I took my test in July of 2015. You had to pass with an 80 or above. And then once you pass your test, you have to build an enclosure for them. Uh, it is it is regulated as well. You have to meet certain standards for this enclosure and have that um, inspected by a game warden. Once that's passed, then you can uh, send everything in and get your application or get your permit for an apprenticeship. So the person you're apprenticing under, they have to you know regulate, watch everything that you do, make sure you're doing everything correctly. After two years. Um, they send in the paperwork, they kind of send in like a letter of, you know, of like a letter to, to the state saying like, hey, this person learned this, 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 and then I can send in my application for a general. So this is going to be my second year as a general falconer. Um, by next summer, I'll be able to take apprentices of my own. So under a general's permit, I can keep up to three birds. I have two today. Um, this one, he is, he was a gift by some really good friends up in Oklahoma, they're, uh, they're Comanche Eagle Priests. They're the only people in the United States that can legally breed and distribute eagle feathers to Native American and Native American tribes. Um, Harris Hawks, this is a Harris Hawk, uh, which you can find in South Texas, New uh, Mexico area. Harris Hawks are really important to them. Um, feather wise and it was a really really big deal that they called me right around my birthday and was like hey we have a baby hawk um, his parents rejected him and actually his mom killed the dad so he was parentless uh, so he's been hand raised that's why he's a little noisy you, you don't like to you don't really want to hand raise hawks unless it's absolutely necessary because of this reason <laughs> But I love him, he's, he's awesome, he's super smart, super smart. These are the only fox in the world that hunt in packs. They, they're the wolves of the sky, that's what they call it. Um, they hunt in family groups of like three to six birds, um, and it's a matriarch system, so usually the females are the ones in charge. This is a male, um, he's much smaller than females too. So, um, but I was very honored to have him gifted to me. But he will be with me for the rest of his life. It is illegal to release imprinted birds back to the wild um, just because they see humans as one of their own. They see humans as a good uh, source of food. So it's just more danger to him if he would be to re uh, release. He'd be approaching people like, hey, what's up? And people would be like, what's going on? So, <laughs> But his name is Noyaka. Um, I, it took me a while to name him because I wanted him to have a Comanche name, just you know, as a little thank you for uh, who I got him from. Noyaka means going places all the time, and he was. Uh, when he was a baby, he just wanted to just go anywhere and everywhere. Um, he loves our cats. He thinks he's a cat too. So uh, he, he actually I, slept in the cat yeah, bed. Yeah, he would sleep in cat beds. Yeah. <laughs> So um, he loves our cats. He, he's like I said, he's a very very smart bird. Um, the bird, I, another bird I have in here uh, is a red-tailed hawk. He is wild caught. Okay, uh, all your birds.
typically, as an apprentice, you have to catch from the wild. And they have to be their very first year. And once they get their adult feathers, once they get past their first year, it is, you, it is no longer legal to catch them because they're part of the breeding population. Um, so you're supposed to only capture first year birds. He is wild, he is able to be released. Um, he's probably the best bird I've ever had to work with so far. Um, very smart too, a very efficient hunter. Um, he, he catches jackrabbits on a regular basis. Um, he was actually able, his first season, compared to my first bird that I ever had, it took her a month for me to actually start working with her to hunt her and everything like that. It took him 16 days. So very smart, very, um, very motivated, very driven bird. And he, just in his first season, he was able to fill our freezer with meat uh, for the next summer, because summer you have to molt them out, get them fat, get them um, lazy so they can molt their feathers and get new ones. Um, it's very dangerous to hunt them while they're molting because they have blood in their feathers, you don't want to break them, um, anything like that. But he was able to fully stock and supply his whole summer and my sister-in-law's bird's summer um, worth of meat. That's how much um, that's how much meat he was able to catch. Are you just going to just talk over me here? Are you wanting to present yourself? <laughs> yes. But I will get him out for y'all. And this is Thorin. So typically, falconry is originally based to, uh, or originally used. Come on, bud. Oh no, it's not a field. <laughs> Basically falconry, yes, it is a sport, it's a hunting sport, but typically it's mainly used to, like I said, you have to catch first year birds. It's mainly used to get those, use those first year birds and get them through their first winter. Mortality rate for them is 90, 95%. Um, so, you know, out of 100 birds, maybe five will survive their first winter. Um, it's very, I mean, you know, the wild's tough, you know, it's a tough, tough life out there. Um, so falconry is used to teach them to hunt, teach them to be self-sufficient, and then once March comes around, which is breeding season for them, you're able to release them back and they're able to survive. Um, that's typically what it's used for. I mean, falconry was able to bring several species back from uh, almost extinction. Um, just for breeding, just for getting them, uh, teaching them to survive, stuff like that. So that's mainly what it's used for. Lately, it's for a little ego boost in some communities. Um, so we, we're trying to teach people, you know, it's, it's for conservation. Um, it's also, it can also, I can't talk because you're talking. So it's basically used for, uh, also for um, pest control. Um, a lot of falconers use uh, hawks, falcons, anything like that for abatement. They'll get hired by companies, airports, baits, stuff like that to keep away, you know, like seagulls, uh, grackles, pigeons, anything like that off buildings. And that's what they do all day. They'll just fly their bird around, keep those birds away, and try to teach those birds, don't come into this building anymore. That's something that's going to eat you. So <laughs> abatement you is not a, need some. Yeah. <laughs> abatement is a pretty common job for falconers if you can find it. Usually falconers have to create their own company for abatements and just kind of advertise themselves around. Um, but other than that though, it is illegal to make any sort of profit off of falconry because abatement has to be licensed. Um, but other than that though, it is illegal, federally illegal to make any sort of profit off of falconry. That's why you don't really see a lot of it on movies anymore um, or anything like that. Usually birds of prey on movies are birds that aren't native to the United States. You can use birds that aren't native. You can use African birds, Australian birds, stuff like that. But any, any bird that's native here, you cannot use for any sort of entertainment, profit, anything like that. Mm -hmm. What? Um, <laughs> I know. So this is, this is Thorin, if any of y'all are familiar with The Hobbit. 
Um, it's a very fitting name for him. <laughs> um, he's, like I said, he's my best bird I've ever had. Um, very tolerable. We first found him, it was a Thursday in June. June 29th, I think, when I first found him. Were we going to rouse for everybody? <laughs> so this, that is a good sign. Uh, that's usually a sign that they're content, they're happy, they're comfortable. Um, now we got a call from one of our friends who uh, manages like a wildlife, kind of like a wildlife center outside of Amarillo. And she told us, hey, there's this, there's this hawk that's been hanging around for the last five days. He's like, he's only be eating like grasshoppers and frogs and he's, he's not doing very well. So me and my husband and his brother went out there, got all my equipment and everything. Um, and yeah, when we first saw him, he was trying to chase little bitty like cowbirds, like little finches and stuff, something that was way too fast for him. He was wasting a lot of energy and we set a trap down uh, with some bait in it. He went straight for it. He wasn't to the trap. Typically a trap that we use is it's a false, false shock tree. What it is, it's a mesh trap, um, double layered. So there's a box inside, like a, a top layer, where you can put the bait in, like a little mouse or a bird or something like that, so it's not gonna be injured, but they're still able to see. And along the wired mesh are like little bitty like nooses of like fishing line, like filament line on a, uh, and nooses, like in a noose sort of, you know. And so uh, once the bird gets on that trap, tries to grab that mouse and they pull, those nooses wrap around their feet. So, um, and those trap's weighted. So they're stuck up there. Well, he didn't attach to the trap. He was just standing right beside it. He allowed us to approach him. Um, we were also told during those five days he was, uh, he was allowing people to come and approach him, take pictures of him, stuff like that, which is very unusual for a wild bird to allow that. And yeah, he just let us grab him. And when I felt him and like inspected him and stuff, he was skin and bones. I mean, he wouldn't have lasted that weekend. So I just went ahead and took him in. It was like, it was still early in the summer. Um, so I wasn't sure if I wanted to keep him or not yet because typically falconry seasons are from September to March. Um, that's what we count our seasons. And so I was just like, ah, oh, it's still a little too early, but I'll see. Cause June is right around the time when they start getting kicked out of nests. And so um, he was very young at the time, and it showed with his <laughs> trying to catch just weird stuff. And um, so I, I fed him up, and already just from that first day, I knew this bird was going to be special. He, you are just so annoying today. <laughs> I am sorry. He's not usually like this. <laughs> so um, no, first night. He ate, uh, he ate from from the fist, which take, typically takes two to three days to do. Because typically the first couple of days, you want them to get used to you first. It's called nanny. You want to teach them, like, hey, I'm not going to eat you. You know, hey, I'm not going to kill you. Because that's their whole reaction the first day or so. It's like they just, they're so scared, out of their wits. Um, you try to man them down. Try to get them exposed to everything as possible, as much as possible. He ate from the fist the first day, or first night. He um, allowed me to touch him, do everything. He was already tolerable for the cats. He didn't mess with the cats at all. And he slept. I mean, how we were right here, he, he basically put his guard down and slept right by me. And already, I was just, I was very suspicious. He, he sat on the fist like this, like a pro. And so, it's very, it's still debatable on whether, because he was also found in a very unusual spot too, because um, there's a rehab center right next to this wildlife center. So we started to suspect maybe someone illegally took him, raised him, realized how much trouble and how much work it is, and just dumped him because of how tolerable he was. So we were also afraid that he's imprinted too, just, um, just with how manageable he was, how tolerable he was with everything. Um, so, I mean, he, great hunter, like I said, 
He's an awesome, awesome bird. Um, so I'm, I'm keeping him, you can keep a bird for as long as you'd like. Um, typically, I mean, you still want to release them, get them, back, get them back to like the breeding population and stuff. But, um, but yeah, you can keep a bird for the rest of its life if you want to, under your permit. So I'm going to keep him for a little bit. Um, we'll see if he's going to be released or not. Uh, like I said, I'm not sure if he's imprinted or if he's just a smart bird. So, um, he catches, it, he, both of these birds really can eat pretty much anything. Um, they can also be scavengers as well. Um, just the other day, there's been, um, every time I drive to work, there's been a dead deer on the side of the road for like a week. And right around the fifth day, I saw a red-tailed hawk eating off of it. You know, it's just, they're scavengers as well. They're opportunist feeders. And so, but, I mean, he's, he's caught both jacks and cottontails, he's caught snakes, um, rodents, and he, he, he's gone after pheasant. He hasn't really particularly caught one yet. <laughs> um, he's also, I mean, they can, they can eat dove, they can eat quail, um, but that's the thing, if they're fast enough, though, these birds are typically just, they're a little bit too heavy to catch the birds. Um, these guys are good for birds, but he, he's spoiled, though. We haven't hunted yet. So, um, do y'all have any questions? I know I'm just rambling, but I mean, like I said, I'm just trying to share experiences and you know, what's. <laughs> so I can just talk about when, talk. when you let them go to hunt, how do you know they're going to come back? Uh, yeah, wonderful. Thank you. So, falconry. The process is you try to teach them to associate you for food. Um, right at the beginning. I know. And so, um, falconry, you typically have to keep them hungry. Um, not really starving, but just enough to where they're all, they're food driven. Absolutely food driven. Um, so, you try to keep them hungry to, enough to where, okay, I will do this. I will come to you for that tidbit, you know, because I'm hungry enough to come to you and trust you that you're going to give me this piece of food. Um, you kind of just slowly work to where once you start getting out to the field then they start to associate you oh you're going to help me get get this big meal this big rabbit and so i basically become a bird dog for them <laughs> that's why it's there uh, and he's, yeah. <laughs> but it, it's all it's a partnership it's it's a learn they learn that we are there to help them um gather their food catch it and then um, you make them trust you that you're not going to take it away from them. It's, it's just a very partnership, working um, <coughs> deal. I know, yes. So, like I said, I you get to where you trust them enough to come back. <laughs> um, there have been many, many moments where people think you know they know their birds. Um, Typically, you don't want to feed them too much. You don't want to get them all like full and cropped up and ready to go because as soon as they are, no matter how long you've kept them, they'll fly off. They'll be like, oh, I'm done with you. I'll see ya. And so the main goal for every falconer, the main goal at the end of the day is to have your bird back with you. That's the main goal all the time, every time, 100%. To go home with your bird. Um, Jalen, can you tell them the story about you losing your bird and finding back, going oh back? Oh gosh, this bird's escaped like three times already. Um, <laughs> the first time, no, the first two times, we believed someone was getting into his enclosure. Um, our door was locking, but it wasn't latching. And so we think someone kept trying to open it up and just let him go, and which has, which is a common thing. You'd be surprised that a lot of people would let you go. Um, so, I mean, we wake up one morning, he's gone. And this is before you are like, just being so annoying. And so, um, so I wake up, he's gone out of his enclosure. And this was before we moved out into the country. And we were catty corner of a park. So lots of trees and stuff. And that, so we knew that's usually where he would go. Um, but no, he would be gone for the whole day. And luckily though, <coughs> 
we knew all of Canyon Police, we knew all of WT Police, so we just notified them, keep your eyes up, you know, look for a bird that has, you know, anklets and, and a belt, and Jess's. Um, and yeah, every time we get some eyes out, we always find them. The third time, and I knew, I knew this would, it, it would happen. We were coming home like two in the morning. I can't remember where we were coming home from. We, we don't have an enclosure out there yet. We just recently moved back in December. So we're st that's still a process, um, getting the money to do that. So he, we have like a little workshop back behind our property that we keep them in. Well, we didn't have a lock yet to the door. And on the way home, we see a guy walk, uh, just walking down the highway towards our property. And I just, you know, back in my mind, I was like, I feel like this guy's gonna go through all of our stuff. Cause we're literally right on the highway. And so sure enough, um, Gosh, no, it was like two days later, some of our friends came over to see our house and Micah brings uh, my friend's husband to show uh, Thorin, opens the door to the workshop, because the door wasn't open, opens the door and he's, he's gone. There was no way of him getting out other than that door opening. So I instantly knew, but that guy went through our stuff. And so, being out in the middle of nowhere, I almost gave up on this guy because I'm like, there's because it was also the windiest day too. So I'm like, he's getting, he's being carried to Herford, or he's being carried to Lubbock even. Um, so I was very very devastated, and I was like, you know, third time's a charm for anything. And that evening, my husband went. We we live close to a national park, and uh, he went looking around that park and on the way out, he was, I mean, it was almost sunset, about to leave, and he sees a bird sitting on some hay bales, round bales. And he's like, that's a weird spot for a hawk to be sitting. And sure enough, he he approaches, gets close. He had a red cup. Typically I have like red solo cups. I typically have their meat in. So he knows what the cup means. And Micah just had a cup just to kind of like show. And so he stipped that cup out of the car and he sees Thorin looking. And he's like, okay, okay, that's, that's Thorin. So, um, so he calls me, and he's already, my husband never calls me, never. And so when he's calling me, I knew it was something to do with this. And I'm like, what? He's like, so I found Thorin, I started crying, I started crying. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, oh, you have him? He's like, no, not yet. And I'm like, don't call me if you don't have them yet. Don't, don't get me all excited because, I mean, we're halfway there. So he was like, I don't have any food on me. What do I do? I'm like, go grab them. Just grab them. And he's like, he'll let me grab them? I was like, yeah. I'd like to say, this bird's special because any other bird would be like, uh-uh. I don't want to deal with you, especially going two days, being out in the wild and doing whatever he wants to do. Um, so, yeah, he went up there. He was kind of trying to show the cup and get Thorin close to him. And Thorin, like, as soon as Thorin knew there wasn't any food in that cup, though, he was kind of like, uh, like, the <laughs> and so, um, but yeah, he, he, I stayed on the phone until he grabbed his, grabbed his little Jess's here and got him home. And he hasn't escaped him. Um, but he is a little escape artist. But we've been very lucky that we've got him each this guy actually got out once. Um, it was more of a stubborn streak, rather, because we were out there, we were outside training, and it was the first time I decided to get, uh, take him off a leash and just let him fly around. Well, we realized that he could get very high up in the tree and did not want to come down to me. So um, he stayed the night outside, um, had mom very worried, um, but we were able to get back out and he came back right back up, or right back to me. So now he's much more trained. Um, he, he's figured out, you know, we have a partnership. Because he said, being a baby, from, from being a baby and having no sort of wild, uh, like wildlife skills or anything like that, other than, you know, wild caught birds and tried to survive a little bit, it, it, 
definitely different because um, I'm basically teaching this one from scratch of how to be a bird. And so, um, so he's a longer process than this one has been. Um, but we are now, I don't know, buddy. But we are now at the process where we've been hiking. I can hike with him and he follows perfect. Um, he just kind of just wants to stay close to me. But I still allow him to be like, you know, go off and do what you want, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm learning to trust him too. Um, so it's been very fun the last couple of weeks that I've been able to go out and hike with him and stuff like that. Um, and he's been excellent. He's, like I said, super smart. He's teaching me to, um, all these birds teach you. So. How long have you had them? I've had this one for over a year now. Um, this coming summer will be my second year with him. Yeah. This one was born last April. Um, and I got him in July when he's still baby baby. He's still like had like fluff. Yeah, he's not even new yet. Oh, are you gonna cast for us? So this is what we do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know you gotta do you gotta get it out. It's a process. So this is when he like I said, this is when they're gonna split up the fur and the and the feathers and stuff like that. It's just, they work it up their crop and spill it out. They typically do this in the morning though. Not in front of company, huh? Not in front of company. <laughs> <laughs> How do you deal with your snakes? Um, we just don't keep them around. Snakes. He's fine. He's, he doesn't really know what they are. Um, this guy, though, like, I don't even keep them together. He, he will kill him, for sure. Um, oh. Yeah. So, he, like I said, he's my hunter. He wants full on, wants to kill everything. Um, Okay, so you think when they go and they get the jackrabbit, you know, do, do you eat the jackrabbit then? Well, no, we keep it for them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, we, me and my husband actually were talking about that last night. Because no, so someone asked that same question. Yeah. And, uh, okay. yeah. Huh? Before you feed it to them. Yes, so yeah. We right. dress it out in the field and then we, uh, we freeze it and it's meals when we can't go out hunting. Because, you know, being yeah. in the panhandle is the windiest place in Texas, I think, or in the world. Um, so, I don't base my hunting days off temperature, I do it off wind speed now. Um, it can be negative four and I'll still go out if we have less than 10 miles per hour winds. You know, that's just how it is. We get it out. Don't swing it at me. Jalen is also a power lifter. Yeah, yeah, me and my husband, we lift weights and compete. Strongman, power lifting, stuff like that. I've been doing it for 10 years. He's been doing it since he was 14, so 17 years, I think, well, since high school. So, uh, yeah, we, we have a lot of things. That's what I said, we're the Wild Canberries, me, him, his twin brother, and his brother's wife. You know, we, we all do this stuff. My, my sister-in-law, his uh, brother's wife, she's a falconer as well. She just got her minerals permit, so she's out of her apprenticeship right now. Um, she has a red tail hawk, and she just acquired a ferruginous hawk, which is the largest hawks in North America, um, the second largest in the world. Um, she's a big, big girl, very, very big, big girl. Um, so we're very interested to see how she'll do out in the field, because they're just getting her to fly outside. Um, and so once she starts accomplishing that, then we'll start hunting her and we'll see how she does. Typically for Rugenists, um, they're ground dwellers. They don't, they don't dwell in trees. They like to nest in fields um, and they love prairie dogs. They will eat all of your prairie dogs. Uh, usually the hawks that you find around uh, prairie dog towns are Rugenists. Um, that's a supple diet for them. Um, but that's the thing. A lot of falconry community doesn't, they don't fly ferruginous because typically a hunting behavior for ferruginous is they stand by a prairie dog hole and wait until they come up and grab them. <laughs> they don't fly, they don't work for it. <laughs> so we're, we're, that's what I say, we're really curious to see how she's going to do hunting wise. Um, 
her bird, her red tail, when she first got her, they they spent months and months trying to trap. If population, like rodent population and stuff, is really good, it's hard to trap a bird because they're always full. You know, they, they they don't need to eat. They don't need to go down to a trap and get to get that rodent. They ate five this morning. You know, so it's it was really hard for them to trap two years ago, and you never never this. So I apologize. Um, <laughs> but, um, so her sponsor was able to trap one. He lives down by like San Antonio, and he was able to trap a bird for her. So they went down there to grab it, and I was I was kind of communicated with her sponsor since he was out of town, and he was like co-sponsored for me since you know, since you're where she is and you teach her and stuff. Because she first got interested when I started training him. So she was actually there throughout the whole training process. I actually had her hunt him a couple of times. So she got hands on experience with him and stuff like that. More than my sponsor ever did. <laughs> so I helped her a lot with her training and her knowledge and you know offered her some of my books, training guides, stuff like that. You did awesome. And so um, when she went to go get that bird, brought her 